Hello everyone, my name's Dave Ellis, my call sign is G4AJY, I'm an ex-ships radio officer and on the recent centenary of the Titanic I wrote a poem to commemorate this, it comes from the heart, it's about the Titanic sinking and radio officers, it's called CQD SOS, CQD was the old SOS call sign and SOS is the new one and at that time they were both in use together so I've called it CQD SOS. We're here at the Sanford Mill in Chelmsford which is mainly a Marconi commemorative uh, museum particularly it's got Marconi's old hut in it the original hut he used at Rittle for the original uh, 2MT broadcast. So this is the poem CQD SOS Jack Phillips at the key we're hold beneath the waterline we're open to the sea CQD SOS stars and ice all round we're stopped and sinking by the bow no longer new york bound cqd sos save our souls this night a dark wet icy grave out there god help us in our plight cqd sos the band is playing now abide with me save me lord though he alone knows how cqd sos launch the lifeboats fast we're going down most will drown the rubicon is past CQD SOS Harold Bright is Harold Bright is sending. The Morse key clicks and sparks abound. For many, life is ending. CQD SOS 46,000 tons going to the bottom soon to be with Davy Jones. CQD SOS the captain gives the word. ROs must abandon ship. And neither man concurred. CQD SOS 1,500 dying. 700 more are saved, Morse code, salvation buying. CQD SOS, Jack Phillips, dead on station. But Bride is saved, a hero now, before a grateful nation. CQD SOS, the tragedy is finished. A grieving world, shocked and sad. So many lives extinguished. CQD SOS, good came from that dark day. Radio's now compulsory, Titanic showed the way. Thank you. I'm speaking to Dave Ellis, on the RO, a radio operator, also called the Sparks. Yeah. Tell us a bit about your career. When did it kick off with Marconi? Oh, <coughs> in the uh, late 60s. And uh, I wanted to combine wireless electronics and travel through my passions. And I found out about this wonderful seagoing career and it took two years of full-time training to get my ticket you can't go to sea without a proper ticket um, and I approached Marconi and uh, they gave me a job straight away I was issued a seaman's card and uh, a discharge book and I joined my first ship in the Royal Albert docks as a junior radio officer and we went on a very interesting trip to um, parts of Europe and then off to the Canaries, South Africa and uh, Portuguese East Africa as it was in those days and came back. I did that trip twice and at the end of that I was no longer a junior. They gave me a ship of my own. So I had a wonderful time at sea. I served on passenger ships, tankers. Could you name them? Um, I can remember the city of Port Elizabeth. That was followed by the Baharistan. Uh, oh dear. Um, I was on the ID Sinclair, uh, the Ness Champion, um, the city of Exeter, the city of Gloucester. Uh, oh, I've, I've lost count of them. There must so be a, on a some, some of the ships, there'd be two sparks. Yeah, but um, I was only on two where there were two sparks because, for economic reasons, they would keep it down to one, and you'd use a machine to keep watch when you were off watch. Yeah, it's called an auto alarm, and there are several in this museum that you can see working today, um, and that would recognise a particular coded distress signal and sound a bell in the radio officer's cabin and on the bridge. And when you heard that bell, you rushed into the radio room and immediately ran up your kit and listened to see who was calling. Did you have any near scrapes? Did you ever go overboard? No. <laughs> That's actually much rarer at sea than you would imagine. Yeah, the, the nearest we had to those were medical emergencies where you've got somebody on board that's seriously ill with appendicitis or something or has hurt himself. And that way, um, <coughs> it's down to the radio officer to get on the key and try to find nearby ships that have got medical advice or even a, a qualified person on board and make a run for port if necessary. How on earth did you keep sailing on board uh, tankers and uh, ships without passengers? Did you go off your head? Not at all, no. We, although we had no computers in those days, <coughs> there were books, there were letters, 
there was the officers mess where there was a bar you could have a pint off duty and chat with other uh, with your colleagues uh, there was um, eight hours a day in the radio room minimum quite often it would be 12 or 13 if there was traffic to clear in off watch period sometimes you would anyway be doing maintenance on your radio equipment so there were always lots of things to do on board and uh, I never got bored, I never tired of it. I hear the stars at night were amazing, did you take up a astronomy? I didn't take up astronomy but you're completely correct, once you're well out into the Pacific or the Atlantic on a clear night the stars are absolutely brilliant because there's so little atmospheric or light pollution there, yes it's wonderful. What do you miss about it? Um, I miss the fact that you're never still. You're always on the move and the next port, you may have been there before or it may be something entirely new, you're going to see new places, meet new people, try new foods and uh, sail new seas. It was always something new, always interesting. Was your mother worried about you? No. <laughs> Did you used to sell mum and send mum and dad a telegram now and again? Oh yes, yes. Um, there's a system on board that we used to have in those days at sea which Mark Honey rang, amongst others, called Ship Letter Telegrams whereby you could send a, a telegram to one of the British coast stations like Portishead Radio and then they would uh, send it through as a letter. So you might be in the middle of the Pacific and yet 24 hours later your loved ones would receive a message from you in the form of a letter which started off as a telegram on the Morse key. So wish yes. you were here. <laughs> I wish I was there. <laughs> what was the most dangerous part of the world you ever sailed? Were there any bombs going off? And what no, was... in those days terrorism was almost unknown. It was, um, it was uh, very little bit about. One thing when I was at sea, most of the time the, uh, the Suez Canal was closed because of course that was the time when it had been blockaded by NASA and his government. And so if you wanted to get to the Persian Gulf as we did many times, they don't call it that now by the way, it's the Arabian Gulf, but to get there, um, you had to go all the way around the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa. So it turned what should have been a couple of weeks voyage into a three month voyage. I bet the, uh, the Cape was uh, very, very uh, shaky stuff. A lot, lot, you know, it was a dangerous route. Well, no, that's the, passage. that's the Cape of Good Hope. It's the Cape Horn that you're thinking of. Mm -hmm. The Cape of Good Hope is only interesting sea-wise for one reason. They've got this very strong nine knot current called the Agulas Current. If you're sailing with it, you go very fast. If you're sailing against it in an old banger, it's like sailing uphill. <laughs> Did you ever go close to Robin Island where Nelson Mandela was held? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You put into Cape Town? Oh, many times, yes, yes. What's the most exciting city that you that you went to, the most uh, magical? Well, fun, London? Uh, funnily enough, I like Sydney best of all. Where? Sydney, Australia. And my favourite port. <laughs> it's still exciting. I've been there quite recently yes. and there's a buzz to it. There is, is yeah. it because the big ships can dock right at the... Which I did, yes, at the Piermont Pier. And um, yes, all the lovely uh, the milk bars, the theatres, uh, the bridge, the museums, the island, the... Uh, I've forgotten it now. Carga Zoo. I can't remember the name now. Been there many times. Yes, I loved it in Sydney and I loved the people, I loved the weather. So to me, that was perhaps my favourite part. Home from home? Yes, it was. It felt like being at home as well. <laughs> Did you have to have a certain temperament to be an RO, to be alone at sea for months and months? You yes. You couldn't every night. <coughs> it's not only that. <coughs> Excuse me. You've got to realise when you're a, a thousand miles out into the Pacific, no matter what goes wrong, whether it's somebody falling into a hatch and hurting themselves, or electrocuting themselves, or the ship on fire, or even, God forbid, sinking, there's only one thing that's going to save the men on board. In those days, that was the RO. You'd get on the Morse key and call for help. So you had to have that temperament ready at all times to face danger. When, at the mm. time you joined, when you were a young lad, mm. Bride Phillips and the Titanic wasn't at the front of your mind. As you grew older, you must have learned to appreciate the sacrifice that they made. The general public wasn't aware, very well aware of that at that time, but we radio officers all learned about the Titanic during our training of uh, radio officer training, part of the history of radio. So we were all aware, well aware of it and knew about it, but of course when you go to sea, and let's say that you are in the middle of the sea, and your main transmitter breaks down, you think, I'm the link, I've got to get this going, there's nobody here to help me, I've got to find out what's wrong with this transmitter, fix it and get back on the air. Then you start thinking, murky thoughts about the Titanic and so forth while you, you're not able to transmit then it comes home to you even though you've learned about it in history and training 
you've, you've thought about it, but it doesn't come home to, to you until you realize suddenly you're the only link, there's something wrong, and you've got to fix it even to be that and link. And you can't transmit to somebody to say, look, I've got this little bit of wire, this has gone wrong, could you help me? No, if the main transmitter's down, you're dead in the water. So did you have a Bible, the Barconi manual, to look oh, at? Oh, we had all the, uh, all the equipment, yes. We had um, manuals and uh, service data. There was also a backup transmitter, so um, if you were really in trouble, that, you could get on the air with that, but the backup transmitter was only medium wave, so you had quite a short range. So if you were uh, really... 100 miles? Yes, and it might be a bit less during the day and so far during night. So we're talking Titanic range? Yes, I mean the tri Titanic uh, really only had medium, it, that is all it had, medium and long wave, and uh, yes, um, they had quite a short range, even though they had very powerful transmitters. At night they could go farther, but during the day they were limited to 50 or 100 miles. Are you a poet? Uh, an amateur poet, yes. Why hadn't you composed that poem years ago? What brought you to, at uh, this time, to do it? Yeah, I composed it um, on the centenary anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic in 2012. And um, it was, I read it out to the uh, Chelmsford Amateur Radio Society. It was public, I read it out to the Radio Officer Association. They've published it, but I wrote it because it came from the heart. I really did a feel all the things that were happening and that brought it home to me the anniversary all the celebrations and the uh and the documentaries and so forth and that just sort of sprang spontaneously from that well you'll get a very warm welcome when you come to hall street okay. we have the titanic radio is it a radio room or wireless room well in those days it was called wireless so that we have a representation i've actually changed all my articles to read home birthplace of wireless, not radio. Yeah, the word radio, dispute. Yeah, radio hadn't been invented then, and the reason it's called wireless isn't because there are no wires in it, it's because you can communicate from one place to another without any connecting wires. Prior to that you had telegraph, after that you had wireless. No telegraph wire, so it's wireless. Well the kids today think they invented wireless by calling it Wi-Fi, <laughs> but effectively this was a Wi-Fi room, wasn't it? Uh, yes, in a way, yes. In that it was a wireless connection, no wires. Yeah. Okay, well in the beginning when ships were being fitted with experimental radio, there were no operators. Marconi would put one of his technicians on board and uh, he, would, um, he would be on there just for the experiment and he wasn't, there was no commercial traffic, nothing to do with navigation or life at sea or anything. When they perfected it, Marconi started making professional installations and he provided his own operators who were trained in Morse code to operate the stations and stay on board. Um, and it continued more or less that way, uh, not just from Marconi, but um, uh, Siemens in, uh, in Germany, for instance, were competitors. But um, it's continued this way um, with more and more ships having radio, but it was still a gimmick and there was nothing compulsory about it um, until the Titanic sank. And there was an absolute outcry. 1,500 people drowned in one go and um, there were enormous uh, hearings and investigations in the US and in Britain and the outcome of it all was that it became a legal requirement for every ship to carry a full wireless installation and a fully trained and certificated wireless operator and he had to know Morse code, he had to know the traffic regulations how to communicate with other ships and shore stations and he was there basically for safety of life at sea in case of an emergency but of course the passenger ships realised they could use this chat to start sending messages from passengers to the shore and so forth. So gradually the role of the radio officer, uh, ra wireless operator as he was then, expanded. Later on, um, obviously, uh, during the war they became uh, absolutely um, uh, invaluable and uh, necessary on every ship. And after the war their role grew even more as the passenger trade picked up. And then you get this part where um, the radio operator or wireless operator, as he was then, his responsibilities become much wider. Now he's responsible for the safety of life at sea, for maintaining his equipment, for um, sending uh, commercial traffic. He's also responsible now for um, uh, other things like uh, accounting. For instance, when you send messages to shore stations, that has to be paid for and the accounts can be kept in many different currencies and also in an international standard called the gold franc. So your radio operator now, your wireless operator, starts to have a lot of other duties. He begins to get duties from the master as well, typing duties and other things like that. And eventually this was recognised and he was, became, rather than an operator, he became an officer. And in the Merchant Navy, up until there were no more radio officers, 
he was known as a radio officer, that's right up until 1998. In the Royal Navy, the wireless operator or telegraphist, his duties are mainly restricted just simply using the Morse key and passing messages to and fro. So he's still known as a wireless or radio operator and not an officer. And that, that condition consists as far, uh, uh, persists as far as I know till today. But as I said, in 1998, the international marine regulations were changed by international agreement that ships could use satellites instead of uh, onboard wireless equipment operated and manned and operated by uh, dedicated radio officers.